All right. We are live here tomorrow and we will finish we will finish the packet on Wednesday. And then you have a review on Thursday. I have a Zoom time set up for you. You have that in your Google Classroom. That's great. And then uh, we will test on Friday over chapters 14 to 17. So let's get started here and get your study guide out and find this page right here. It says William Lloyd Garrison, 1831, The Liberator. Okay, so find that William Lloyd Garrison, 1831, the liberator in your study guide, and that's where we're that's where we're going to begin. Now, who he was was that William Lloyd Garrison was an abolitionist uh, living in Boston. That was the seabed of ab the abolitionist movement was Boston, Massachusetts. But he's going to take things upon himself, and he's going to start his own newspaper in 1831 called The Liberator, that you see there. And what it was, it wasn't a newspaper reporting the facts and the weather and what was going on. It was a pro-abolitionist. Uh, newspaper. There was an agenda. Uh, it wasn't journalism per se, where I'm going to go out and just report the facts. This was a paper intended to sway people over to the side of abolition. And it's going to take root there. It's going to become a very popular newspaper, which then leads to the next topic there, the 1833, the American Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, that's going to be uh, done by, again, William Lord Garrison. He's going to uh, set this society up uh, because his newspaper's been so popular with the idea that we're going to organize uh, politically and to abolish the institution of slavery and do away, do away with it here in the country altogether on a national scale. Uh, people like him are uh, seen as a nuisance down south, but in the 1830s, there really is no threat of abolition yet. Uh, and so it's, it's a, but it's a growing movement and within 30 years, there will be a huge uh, anti-slavery abolitionist movement here in this country. Uh, looking at our next topic there, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was the poster boy of the abolitionist movement up in Boston. He was a runaway slave who had escaped and come up north uh, and had gotten an education, was well-spoken, and had the gift of oratory. And he's going to be asked to give speeches at different abolition uh, rallies and meetings. But one of his eight... Hey, Knock it out of the park here. Give us a good July 4th speech. And he actually makes the speech as kind of a down for the people there because he says, I'm not celebrating the day. I, this, is, this is after the Compromise of 1850 with the Fugitive Slave Law. He says, how can I celebrate independence and freedom today? And you guys are celebrating the clause in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And Frederick Douglass of the crowd said, I don't have that. I'm not free. I'm not equal in the eyes of all. Because at any time, bounty hunters could come grab me and seize me because under the letter of the law, I'm a fugitive from justice. And that sobered a lot of people because, uh, they're like, yeah, we're, we, need to, we need to be all free. And again, furthering the abolition movement down the road, saying this country needs to be all free uh, and not part and part uh, half slave, half free. Uh, as this movement grew, you see the next topic there, the 1836 gag rule. Uh, there were Southern uh, legislatures that were, and Southern uh, congressmen that were getting upset by all this, and so they had a majority uh, in the House and the Senate at this time, and they, posed, they passed what was known by as the gag rule that in 1836, which said that no discussion of abolition or the prohibition of slavery could be discussed in Congress for eight years. That's a it's kind of a silly rule, but it's like kind of the thing when you don't want to hear it and you put your fingers in your eh, I don't want to listen to it. Southern Democrats didn't want to listen to um, hear anything about prohibiting slavery because, again, they saw this as a threat to their livelihood and their way of life, that they depended on slave labor uh, to fuel the agricultural machine that was the Southern economy. And by, by 1830, it's cotton. Cotton is king. Uh, and they, the Southern economy has all their eggs in one basket in the economy. You have to have slave manpower uh, to do that. Hey, going to the next topic there. Uh, yes. Uh, 1807, the abolition of the slave trade. In, 18, in 1807, England abolished slavery under the leadership of a guy named William Wilberforce, uh, who had led a 25-year campaign to abolish the institution of slavery. And now England has made slave 
uh, has made slavery illegal and also the slave trade. And again, they're the biggest boy in the block. They've got the biggest navy. So what can England do? They can impose their will anywhere in the world. And so now if you're going to try and execute the triangular slave trade of going from Africa to the Caribbean to the United States back to Africa with guns and molasses and uh, the slave trade, England is patrolling the waters off the coast of Africa and is stopping this. So in wanting to keep peace also with England, the United States in 1807 by law abolishes the slave trade. So let's be clear on this. The United States does not abolish slavery in 1807. They abolish the slave trade, meaning there'll be no more triangular trade coming from Africa uh, here to the United States. Will there be smugglers? Yes, there will, because it's still a very lucrative business. Will there be slaves that we brought in from the Caribbean illegally? Yes, there will. Uh, we'll look at something. Uh, we've already looked at something. I don't know if I include the Amistad incident in your study guide, uh, but if not, we'll touch on that uh, in, in the next chapter as, a, as an accelerant towards civil war. And so now the slave trade can still go back and forth here in the United States, but there'll be no further importation of slaves here in the United States. Our next topic, uh, Nat Turner. Uh, Nat Turner is, a, gonna be a, is a slave in Virginia who's gonna lead a rebellion that scares a lot of people. Uh, in the end, what, I, what he, he ends up liberating several slaves from different, several different plantations and they'll kill their owners. And as their movement grows, there's concern among the whites of Virginia that they're in danger. In the end, Nat Turner will kill over 70 white people in his rebellion in his quest for freedom. He'll eventually be caught uh, and hanged. Uh, the others will also be executed. And there was such a hatred in the South for Nat Turner and that they didn't want to make a martyr of him or have any place for people to go or slaves to go. And so they're going to uh, burn his body, uh, smash smash the bones what's left and just scatter it to the four winds because they didn't want any a memorial anywhere for, for Nat Turner. But Nat Turner is uh, goes down in American history as that you have an, the first organized uh, rebellion attempt that's going to spark is, is going to scare a lot of Southern plantation owners, and then uh, also lead to further rebellions down the road. And he's going to be the inspiration for that, particularly when we get to 1859 and John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. He's going to use Nat Turner as an inspiration 28 years later. Harry, uh, 1834, the expulsion from the Lane Theological Seminary. A guy named Theodore Weld, who was a student at uh, the Lane Theological Seminary. Uh, was promoting on campus the whole idea of uh, the ending slavery, I mean, excuse me, uh, ending slavery. And he was preaching this doctrine on campus. And Lyman Beecher, the president of the school, said, we're not going to have that here. And Theodore Well will be expelled uh, from Lane Theological Seminary for the very, just for the very thing of saying that it's, a, it's biblically wrong. It's biblically wrong to have slavery and he'll be kicked out of, he'll be get, excuse me, He'll be kicked out of school for that by Lyman Beecher, uh, who, again, was a, a component in the uh, second grade awakening. Our next person there, Harriet Tubman. We all have heard of her. There's a movie that just came out about her recently. Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. She herself will escape and get up to the north. Now, again, this is prior to the Compromise of 1850, which we haven't got to yet with the Fugitive Slave Law. And so if you could get across the Ohio River into what was called free soil, then, then you were free. And she herself will be one of these people, she'll make it, but she left a lot of her family behind. And she can't in good conscience, she says, stay free while her family's still in bondage. And so she'll go back uh, and again, through a series of safe houses, uh, help her family escape to freedom up north also. This is what was known as the Underground Railroad. And it was a, just basically a network of safe houses where slaves, runaway slaves traveled at night in these houses during the day. Harriet Tubman's going to have a huge bounty on her head. But in the end, she's going to help more than 300 runaway slaves get to freedom. And she'll make almost, I believe, 20 trips back to the South at, high, at risk of her own life to bring these people to freedom. And the one thing that they use as a navigation by traveling at night is they looked at Polaris or the North, North for me is that way. Uh, they looked at the North Star as their guide. As long as that was in front of them, they were headed the right direction, and they and they could get to freedom. Uh, but she's forever memorialized as the conductor of the Underground Railroad. As a matter of fact, I believe it's in 2026 that she is supposed to replace Andrew Jackson uh, on the $20 bill 
uh, and with her likeness. And if you remember, I think I may have brought this up before, originally Harriet Tubman was supposed to replace Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill because nobody really knew who he was until the musical Hamilton came out. And when women heard about this legislation, there was such an uproar that they said, okay, okay we'll take, we'll leave Hamilton on the 10 and we'll take ugly Andrew Jackson, the slave owner, off the $20 bill and replace him with Harriet Tubman. Soldier of Truth that you see on your sheet there, she's also a former slave uh, who had run away, but was also an advocate for women's rights. And the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, which we'll, uh, we'll get to, which was uh, the first, was the watershed moment for the women's suffrage and the women's rights movement, she's going to remind white women that black women also need to be included in this in their declaration of rights of that all men and women are created equal. So the truth was do not forget the minorities, of the minority women also, because we're all equal. Uh, we're all created equal in God's eyes. And don't forget them. Uh, so we're going to flip the page here. You should be on this page right here. It says the 1842 Webster Ashburton Treaty. So again, we should be on that page now, the 1842 Webster Ashburton Treaty. Now, what this was, there, this this was passed here. It was a, a, a treaty between England and the United States. Uh, there had been unclear borders in the Oregon uh, in the Oregon Territory of where the United States ended and England began, and also there had been border disputes between Maine and what is now Canada. And this treaty, basically, what it did was it made the 49th parallel the border of the United States between Canada and uh, the United States. And so if you look at a map today, that line that goes across all the way to the, all the, way to the Pacific Ocean is the 49th parallel, except when it gets to Vancouver Bay. And it dips because uh, England went all, all of Vancouver Island uh, in this treaty, and the United States uh, uh, acquiesced to that, but also the United States had clear borders and got what they wanted on the main Canadian border. And so this treaty, the Webster Ashburton Treaty, finalized our current northern border of the lower, lower 48 contiguous states. So from Maine, all the way across to the Great Lakes, up above the Lake of the Woods and the 49th parallel, all the way over to Vancouver, uh, that finalized the border of what the United States and what it looks like today. And then we would acquire Alaska at a later time and set those borders. Uh, the next topic there, John Tyler, the Whig Party and the National Bank. If you remember correctly, John Tyler is the 10th president of the United States. And John Tyler came to be president because of the sudden death of William Henry Harrison in 1841 after only 31 days in office. Remember, he had given an inaugural address in a sleet storm, contracted pneumonia, and then died after 31 days in office. And John Tyler became the 10th president. And he was known as his as his accidency uh, because he became president. But he's going to alienate his own party, uh, the Democrats, because what the Democrats wanted to keep is they wanted to they wanted to re up the National Bank or the Bank of the United States. And John Tyler, he'll be seen as a traitor by his own party, and he will kill pass legislation to kill the Bank of the United States. And so when the excuse me, that's the Whigs, the Whig Party, not the Democrats. John Tyler was a Whig. And so the, the Whig Party will not renominate uh, John Tyler for a second term. And so you're going to have uh, two new candidates. The You're going to have what's a guy named James K. Polk. Now, at their convention, at their convention, uh, James K. Polk's party, he wasn't even on the, he wasn't even on the ballot or he wasn't even in consideration. But after, Numerous debate at the convention. John, I mean James K. Polk became the nominee of their party, and he became. This is where we get the term the dark horse in the race. He became the first dark horse because he was an unknown. Nobody knew who this guy was. He was from Tennessee, and like, who is this guy? Uh, his opponent is going to be our old friend Henry Clay uh, from the corrupt bargain of 1824 uh, when he was Speaker of the House, sealed the deal for John Quincy Adams, and then remember. Henry Clay had been uh, John Quincy Adams' Secretary of State. Henry Clay is very active in politics. Remember, he's the author of the Missouri Compromise of 1820. He's the Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams. He'll also, when we get to it, author the Compromise of 1850, which will also be very controversial. But Henry Clay wants to be President of the United States. 
remember that in 1828, John Quincy Adams lost the election to Andrew Jackson and Henry Clay's hopes of becoming, remember the Secretary of State was the springboard of the presidency, uh, were quashed when Andrew, Andrew Jackson won the election of 1828. However, uh, they're going to run against each other here, and Henry and James K. Polk is going to win a resounding election. You look at the numbers there in the Electoral College. Uh, he'll he'll get 100. Uh, James K. Polk will receive 170 votes. Electoral votes to Henry Clay's 105, and James K. Polk becomes the 11th president of the United States. And then the last thing we'll look at here today on your sheet there is John Tyler's legacy in the 28th state. Now, in 1845. Uh, Texas uh, was making overtures to um, the United States about becoming a part of the Union or being annexed. Uh, the Republic of Texas had been around nine years, from 1836 to 1845, and they were having issues, uh, finance, specifically financial, and they most of Texas was being populated by, by Americans who had migrated there uh, into Texas, into the Republic. And so John Tyler... Uh, initially said, initially put to the Senate a treaty to annex Texas. Because remember, it has to be a treaty because Texas is not a territory. Texas at this time is its own independent nation. And to pass, to ratify a treaty, you have to have a two thirds majority pass it in the Senate. Well, John Tyler didn't have enough to do that. So it failed in the Senate. So he comes back in March of 1845, right before he leaves office. And there's one other thing that the president can do to get a treaty ratified. You can have it, the Senate will confirm it with a two thirds majority, or you have a joint resolution, but it has to pass, the treaty has to pass by a simple majority in both the House and the Senate. And that's what John Tyler does. So on March 2nd, 1845, a joint resolution, 50% of the House voted for it, and 50% of the Senate voted for it, uh, passed, signed the resolution to annex Texas and make it the 28th state. And two days later, John Tyler will leave office. Texas will officially enter the union on December 29th, 1845, again, being the 28th state. And Texas today, te what Texas looks like today is not what Texas looked like back then. Uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico was in Texas. Denver was in Texas. Uh, Abilene, Kansas was in Texas. Uh, even all the way parts of Wyoming, half, half of Eastern Colorado was in Texas and Southern Wyoming half of Nebraska, half of Kansas, uh, and uh, part of Oklahoma. It was all part of what was the original Republic of Texas. But we'll get to that when we get to the Compromise of 1850 on why Texas looks like what it does today. But with that, John Tyler, uh, that's his legacy, is that he was the one that brought Texas into the United States and making it the 28th state. We honor him in Texas today because Tyler, Texas, is named after John Tyler. And the large public high school in Tyler, Texas is called Tyler, John Tyler High School in Texas. And if your daddy's aware, it's one of the greatest high school football teams ever assembled. Earl Campbell was Heisman Trophy winner at Texas, played at Tyler, John Tyler. But there were six guys off that high school team that played in the NFL. It was incredible. But that's just me personal uh, on that. That's uh, interesting to me. All right. That's a good place to stop right there. We will finish the pack tomorrow because what we're going to cover tomorrow is the war with Mexico. Uh, remember that you uh, uh, will finish tomorrow, review on Thursday at, at 2 p.m. on Zoom. You have that link uh, to join if you want to join. And then we will test on Friday over chapters 14 to 17. So that takes us to the end there. I hope all of you are well. I miss being around all you guys. This is different, sitting in a room, staring at a screen, looking at myself. I guess this is what you guys have to see every day when I'm up in front of the room. But uh, it'd be – hopefully we'll uh, – we can get this thing behind us and get life back to normal. But again, blessings on you and your family. Blessing, God bless the United States of America uh, and he, keeping us all safe. Uh, remember that God is our refuge and our strength uh, in, in trying times. So with that, I bid you farewell and I'll, I'll speak to you again on Wednesday. Bye-bye.